expect the, the, the people of the town to be storming the doors. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. If they have pitchforks, it's all for me. I get that. No. So, introductions? Introductions. Uh, my name is David Nixon. I am the town administrator. John Syback, I represent Hadley in the great general court. And, and I actually served the lieutenant governor uh, in that role. Mm -hmm. Sat in the first division, she sat in the second division. Yes, we did. That's great. I'm Christian Stanley, select board member here in Hadley. Uh, just was voted in with David uh, two days ago on Tuesday, so new to the job. I'm Pat Carnavali, I'm the director for the Governor's Western Mass Office. Okay, Lincoln is working for the Lieutenant Governor. Okay, Molly Keegan, um, member of the Hadley Select Board, uh, currently the clerk. Everyone knows, but uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll go. Um, David Phil, and I uh, was just elected two days ago to the select board as well. Uh, John Moskovitz, uh, second term on the select board, and Tom Hadley. You're, you're a newbie in town, right? You haven't lived, you're, you and your family haven't lived here very long, have you? Uh, fourth generation already, I believe. <laughs> Maybe fifth. I don't know. It's enough. So, uh, we understand that this is somewhat of a listening session, that this is part of your um, outreach through the, the Commonwealth. I know you've been to how many municipalities now? I, you rattled off a number at the MMA I'm, conference. I'm almost done. I have a handful yeah. left to visit, and all 351 are pro plugged into the Best Practices Program. Great, great. So yeah, we're um, Commonwealth Compact uh, recipients and very grateful for it. So, yes, you so thank you. I'd yeah. love to talk about that today. Sure. sure. Uh, you've been able to stack your grants, which is great. So starting mm -hmm. with best practices, I think they were around financial management was mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. uh, new policies there. Then applying for regionalization and efficiencies grants, citizen engagement was another, mm -hmm. and then IT funds. So you were able to take advantage once you plugged in to the various uh, grant programs available to you. So I'm just anxious to hear how yep. that's all going for you yep. and anything else that you'd like to talk about. Um, the most important thing is I like to see, and I know the representative does too, is just who, who's the leadership team? You know, who wakes up in this community every day and you know, worries about it, thinks about it, plans for it, and you know, prepares it for more opportunity? And then what's the plan, right? Mm -hmm. How do you take, the, take all the vision and the ideas and turn it into a plan of action? And then how can we, as your partners at the state level, uh, work with you to provide resources and support to help that plan become a reality. It's basically what we're trying to do in every community, every region of the state. And uh, it's really, I think, uh, helping us uh, spread and be very strategic around our state dollars and making sure that they're getting to all the pockets and places of the state, not just Eastern Mass, around the big city, everywhere. And you may have heard from some of our secretaries, like Secretary Jay Ash, who spends a lot of time traveling and thinking about the economy across our state and how in every region you have to, just different assets and different strengths, and we need to play up to those. And uh, I think, you know, everywhere in our state, you know, the unemployment levels have gone down. In fact, the number of people looking for work is down in every, every region by 30, 40 percent. So more people working, more people earning more, it's all, it's all good. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're continuing to grow more jobs so that people stay in your community. They don't leave because they can't find it. You're you know, bringing some new ideas to the board. And uh, I think the true measure of success for any community is when the next generation stays because there's good jobs, that there's good schools for their kids, that there's a good quality of life, <coughs> culture, arts, entertainment, things to do, activities. So that's really the whole um, sort of view that we have around community development. And it all starts with you. <laughs> and as a former selectman, uh, and Charlie as well, uh, we are grateful to the people who look to serve mm -hmm. and to give back and come to meeting rooms like this and stay up late at night and <laughs> wrestle through the issues and debate with your friends and colleagues that you know uh, as neighbors and get to a better place for your town. It's, it's great stuff. You've got a very uh, <laughs> capable and dedicated public servant here uh, that has given a lot to you and 
Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, yeah, and I wish you'd sure. stay. <laughs> but, but the time does come for others to want to come in and serve as well. So, so. it's really, I mean, the impact here, it seems to me, is Steve Hewlett, and then I'll be Peter passing. Yeah. So to lose three of us, it's going to be a big, a big deal and a big change. And I think that's where I think you you will recognize it. You know, you know the three of us. I did. Uh, and, and I think the assistance in terms of going forward, um, it, it will make a difference. Um, the Lieutenant Governor and, and I earlier were at HCC and talked about the culinary arts and you know, one of the other things was South Hadley, for example, got a quarter of a million that really starts the culinary arts. And I think what we can do here in terms of putting things together, um, I want to throw one item on the table that may or may not be on your list sure. that is significant for this region. And that's pipelines. And specifically in this community, this would be a community served by Berkshire Gas as opposed to Columbia Gas. Uh, and it's been a moratorium for years that I think has had a significant impact on, on development of this community. And no end in sight. Pardon? And no end in sight. That's right, no, no end in sight. Uh, I think there's some people that are proposing some alternatives and some options, but but Berkshire's not giving any responses. Okay. Uh, and, and kind I of alternatives what, are, they, are they highlighting? What, what, what I've heard most recently is the possibility of, of bringing in compressed natu natural gas <laughs> and, and as opposed to an LNG, a CNG. Uh, and, and a proposal, I think, has been, been, been made with, with no response. I know Steve, Steve and Stan are trying to mm -hmm. get a response from Berkshire. Um, the interesting thing is there are several, there are two different moratoriums here. So Hadley uh, and Amherst are affected by Berkshire moratorium. Northampton and East Hampton were affected by Columbia's moratorium. Columbia was proactive in terms of trying to look at a solution. Basically what they were trying to do was, was say, okay, we've allocated all this, this natural gas from these various communities, and so Holyoke, Westfield, Chicopee, can we take 5% of your allocated portion? And dedicate to these other communities. Uh, Berkshire's had no proposals, no opportunities, no, no options. And in essence, when you've got communities that and restaurants are coming in saying, "I, I need to, I, I need natural gas," things were so bad. It was even the, the local mall uh, at the store closed that had gas. All the stores went went to go in, and they said, "No, there's a moratorium. We won't let you in there, even though it's the same use or whatever." So I think one of the major obstacles, that, and we're, we're talking beyond the environmental issues, but one of the major obstacles to further development in this community is, is, is that natural gas moratorium with no end in sight. And that's all I wanted, but I, I, I wanted to throw that one in. <coughs> exactly. It wasn't really a problem for the bigger chain stores that came in new with a new building and they put new tanks and that were able to switch over at some point if they were going to put underground uh, utilities in and upgrade them. But the, the real sticker was when, when someone had closed and then they went to open up, that, that was just a, a shot at everyone, you know. Um, along the underground utility lines, uh, while we're on that subject, the water and the sewer lines, the infrastructure of the state road, I, I've been reading in a paper, and everybody has, about the problems with District 2, but we really need uh, more open communication between District 2 and, and us especially with the Route 9 projects coming down the way here. Uh, we've got probably two and a half million dollars worth of underground work that somehow we, we can't afford, obviously, but if we could write some grants for some of it, uh, some of it's 1904 water line, some of it is asbestos cement water line, and okay. these are two major issues that are, are regulated through the state that we're having some trouble with. All right, so the Route 9 project, mm -hmm. State Road, yep. obviously, uh, is part of the project. Is it more than resurfacing? Yes. It's installing? <clears throat> well, we, it was, the plans are 25%. And the last time someone had come into contact with us, 
Uh, it was supposed to be a reconstruction. And then at some point in the last couple months, David, you were notified that it might be a uh, resurfacing only now? Right, and it was never very clear as mm -hmm. to exactly what the scope of the work is. But we were able to partner with Mass DOT for the reconstruction of Route 9 for a portion of the road here. We've replaced water lines that are savings of hundreds of thousands of dollars to the town. Your dollars. So you bonded the, the funding for yeah. the underground utilities. Yes. Which is great. Which so if you're going to start repairing a road, you might as well look underneath and Absolutely. upgrade the infrastructure. So we would like to be in the position to take that, that advantage and partner with Mass DOT again for the next phase for, of this. For okay, the so next phase or the final two phases or however. Right, on going. the next phase, yeah. are you looking for Mass DOT to fund the underground utilities or do you have bonded, bonded authority for that? Probably a little bit of both. Some type of help. Okay, so the, the next phase, is that 25% design? That's yes. that 25% okay. design. Right. And uh, I guess our concern is, is that project is, is a, a big opportunity for the town of Hadley to replace aging infrastructure. Yes. But the scope of the project is so large that we may not be able to afford this on our own. All right, is the, the infrastructure, it's a replacement, so there's water and sewer so there, that's how mm -hmm. you were able to build yes. that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. commercial activity yes. along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes complete sense, this is your economic development. Well, and and our, our chairman at the time, last week, actually last night, <laughs> uh, mentioned because we're in the five college area that maybe it's something that the University of Massachusetts could also step up and, and help us with. Or, or help open up the funding yeah, opportunity. Yeah, and writing a grant or something like that. Well, in thinking about it, you know, we, um, <coughs> the, the chancellor has been uh, terrific in terms of his community outreach because quite frankly, for a while, uh, for a long while, um, Amherst, uh, the town of Amherst had a strong relationship with the university, but the university didn't necessarily reach out to mm -hmm. Hadley quite as often. And, and you get a lot of the traffic and well, a third of the, the campus is, a, and, is and, Hadley. And the Hadley. Yeah, so their treatment plant, the Mullen Center, that is actually Just in the town of Hadley. Hadley. Stadiums in Hadley. Um, so I think yes. the yeah, so the thought is that, um, I mean, we're, we're really the main corridor to the university. Yes, you are. So the success of the university in large part depends on, on our success. Um, and again, we're very grateful for the economic development that the presence of the university has afforded us. Um, clearly, many, many employees of the university live here in town. Yes. You know, so we're, it's, it's a strong partnership. Um, and thinking about this infrastructure, it would seem that it would be in everybody's best interest to work uh, collaboratively on Can I ask you, on, on Route 9, just, can you mm -hmm. give me just a sense of the kinds of businesses? I, I see what I see, but I'm wondering, are new opportunities coming to the town? Mm -hmm. uh, need for more uh, workforce kind of housing, uh, more uh, commercial development, more office space kind? of higher, better uses might be available? It, it's really pretty mixed, and we're, the uh, Piner uh, Valley planning is in a process of some more uh, affordable housing. I know that the planning board has that on their table right now. Uh, what else, David? Well, the, the, as you said, it's a mix. We have the big boxes, <coughs> and we have this, mm -hmm. uh, the mother and father uh, uh, establishments right. that you were mentioning. Uh, making sure that the next generation coming up has a place to be in Hadley yes. and so we want to be able to provide that entrepreneurial spirit with a, a, an opportunity to build small, medium and large uh, facilities here. Uh, Do you have a, a, an updated housing production plan? No. And, and so that's actually something that we just did a master plan update mm -hmm. um, and the master plan update clearly um, highlights housing um, and a, a diversity of housing as being a, a challenge um, currently. Our bylaws right now um, do not necessarily allow for a breadth of housing, um, housing stock options, if you will. So for example, currently we don't have any uh, facility that allows us to put in condominiums, that, that type of thing. Okay. So that is something I believe that the planning board now that the master plan has been updated, is going to take a closer look and, and prioritize um, 
and again, to the extent that it can be tied into economic development opportunity, I think we can make a stronger argument for some changes. Um, okay, here so I, I have a, an interesting uh, opportunity here, and the uh, representative can speak to this too. So we know in Massachusetts, great state, a lot of growth in our economy, but we are not an affordable and accessible place for housing. We just don't have enough of it. We need to build more housing all across Massachusetts. But our thinking is that it needs to be the housing that communities want and need in their community. You should be driving the planning process for the kinds of housing that will work in your town um, or your city. So we filed a bill called the Housing Choice Bill that basically in incentivizes communities to adopt uh, one of nine best practices uh, that will allow you to adopt that best practice by a simple majority vote as opposed to a two-thirds vote to change your zoning to reach that kind of housing. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been a barrier in Massachusetts because we're so parochial uh, about zoning. But we feel housing can be an economic development tool for you. It can be a very stabilizing force to helping the next generation afford to stay in the community, helping older people who want to leave their single family house and move into a different kind of housing arrangement. If that housing existed in the community, that could then free up that single family housing for someone else to come into town. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking to accomplish in the bill is has been heard by the legislature. There's a lot of support for it. Mass Municipal Association has endorsed it. And uh, when that gets passed, hopefully by the end of the term, it will give you more tools, toolkit, to develop mm -hmm. the kinds of housing, or plan for, and then develop the kinds of housing that you need. In our bill, we contain uh, technical assistance to help a community plan out the kinds of housing that you choose. And our bond bill, which is also in front of the legislature, has a, a lot of dollars for constructing the kinds of housing that you would choose. Mm -hmm. So we do have a, a lot hopefully coming soon mm -hmm. that we can work with you on in that, in that area. But we really feel a town or city needs to think about where they want their housing uh, and plan for that as opposed to being forced with, say, a 40B mm -hmm. that you might not want mm -hmm. uh, in a particular area of the town on you. And I think this could be very productive for you. Good. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I mean, three figures I kind of learned from my campaigning. I mean, I might be speaking out of school. I don't know where we're at, but um, is that, you know, Hadley's population, the school age population is decreasing. So, like in the last five years, we've lost 13% of our school age population. So, that makes it tougher for school funding and all these things. Um, the senior population, there is like a group of seniors that can't afford affordable housing, but can't afford <laughs> housing prices in Hadley, so they can't stay here, so they've got to find somewhere else to live. And I had one more, but I forget what it was right now. Oh, yeah. But um, Workforce um, housing. Just workforce housing, yeah, just that people yeah. usually that work in Hadley can't um, afford to live in Hadley. It's about, I think it's 16% of people that work and live in Hadley or somewhere around that number so and you know I think we're, a lot of people are commuting back and forth either in or out of Hadley. Mm -hmm. I think we're just about pushing 25 percent of the senior population okay. in Hadley right now too. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. These are these are real big concerns. This is know. a really good opportunity for you. Yeah. We would love to yeah. partner with you yeah. once the, the bills get passed to be able to plan ahead for you and with you. It'll be exciting. Well, and, it, and this is, I think, maybe somewhat ancillary to that. At the, um, the MMA conference, there was a, a session that was talking about kind of putting the uh, kind of land that's laying around, doing nothing, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, business. Yeah. And so that there's opportunity for uh, divestment to put that state-owned land into, into production, so to speak, right? Yes. Um, is there any thought of having any sort of an assistance program for municipalities to actually acquire land to help us? Because we only have so many dollars to go around, and <clears throat> land is precious. And, you know, we recently were able to, um, through somebody coming out of 61A, uh, acquire, was it a seven-acre parcel? Nine-acre Nine acre parcel up in North Hadley. But it it would be wonderful to have opportunity to make the purchases to um, 
Yeah, I've enhanced some of these programs as well. So would the purchases be for uh, development or for preservation? Um, Either or, but I'm just I'm honestly thinking more economic development right. opportunities. Yeah, yeah. So over the 55 housing, yeah. things like that. That's the other problem. We've got so much APR land now. Right. It's undeveloped. Right. So we, You're looking to expand your tax base. Yeah. So mm -hmm. more taxpayers, <coughs> um, commercial taxpayers, industrial taxpayers, mm -hmm. more taxpayers can expand your tax base. Yeah. Um, and you have to do that within the confines of. Uh, properties that can be either improved for higher and better use or be developed <coughs> from our land. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, in terms of that, we have and representative knows very well the, the MassWorks program mm -hmm. is our largest infrastructure program. Uh, we have asked for another the current program, five hundred million dollars, is is almost fully committed. So we put it before the legislature through our economic development bill another uh, round of three hundred million dollars to add to that. Mm -hmm. That is the that is the the pot of public funds that can attract private dollars to be able to come together with you to develop properties. Mm -hmm. So the private dollars would be more aligned with the yeah, acquisition of property, but our dollars could be used to extend water and sewer lines traffic signals, uh, roadway reconfigurations, mm -hmm. the infrastructure that's needed to attract a private developer. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, housing funds uh, through various pots of, and programs that can attract private development to come in for acquire property for development. Yeah. So we can a work with the, you on yeah. help. A lot of the available, funds. developable property that we have right now um, is is on our utilities anyway. Okay. So that's that's a good thing with the part, you know, like mm -hmm. that uh, the library, proposed library property on North Maple Street, that's a big parcel of land and there's water and sewer already there. So, you know, there's still some option, optional pieces that are, are, are available, you know. Is there any state land that is Located within Hadley, that could be it, that's not being used for anything uh, in particular no, from an agency state standpoint. State owned land, the quarter of the UMass campus uh, is state owned land. Uh, there's some parcels there that we were looking at for an anaerobic digester, but I don't think that project went forward. Uh, not enough support, uh, and I'm not sure if that was technically is feasible. A lot of the mountain ranges uh, stand on land. Uh, a lot of land along the Connecticut River is stayed on. Okay. And can you describe any of that land in a, in a way that would be uh, available for development, or is it in areas that are sensitive? Okay. So I thought. State parks. Correct. Um, okay. <coughs> well, welcome, Sam. Senator. Sorry for being late. Let me interrupt. Okay. We were, we were just discussing. I'm very pleased to have uh, Senator Rosenberg here and Representative Seibach, and we're having a conversation to update uh, our administration on some of the things that you're working on, uh, including the best practice program that seems to have been going well, uh, getting an update on transportation projects, including Route 9, which is the major thoroughfare here and see if we can coordinate uh, more utility updates as the next phase of construction takes place and having a very um, healthy conversation around housing. And the two bills that are before the legislature are both the Housing Choice Bill and others uh, and the Housing Bond Bill to think uh, more broadly across the state around how we can produce more units of housing that are appropriate for a community and, and let the community be the driver of what they want for housing, whether it's millennial housing, workforce housing, transit uh, oriented development housing, um, or um, housing for citizens as they age to be able to stay in a community. So we have, we have some more work to do in that area. Hadley's in an interesting place, right? Being so closely intertwined with uh, the university and other uh, colleges uh, and, and schools yeah. in the area. The five college area, really. Yes. Uh, 
we're, we're, we're a major intersection in a very small town between all the big cities really, you know, for the most part. Um, and we're, we're kind of growing out of control <laughs> at some point here, you know. And you want to be more in control of your, your destiny. Yeah, yeah. In that way. One of the, the big issues, I think, is going back to affordability is uh, without dealing with the gas moratorium and without being able to grow our commercial tax base and industrial tax base, there's you know not a lot of options other than to raise taxes across the board and to pay for all of our programs, to pay for the infrastructure improvements, yeah. uh, issues like that. So if we can find a way to deal with these issues that are stopping our growth that we could potentially do on our own if people get out of the way, then you know, I, I think we'd be in a better place overall. We could keep our tax tax rate as one of the lowest in the states, and it would develop. You know, it would, it would encourage residential and commercial development. So it would be a big help. I think that the housing piece would be a really big part of that yeah. to help you have right. more tools to right. uh, address your, your zoning right. uh, to allow for the right kinds of housing here. Right. On energy, uh, we have to believe in the combo platter uh, and <laughs> diversify uh, energy supply across the board. Uh, working with the uh, Senator and the Representative, uh, our Executive Office and the Legislature passed a landmark uh, piece of legislation to diversify energy in this state, uh, adding uh, more solar, uh, capacity for hydroelectricity, and also deep water wind. And those procurements uh, are out there. Uh, where we are looking to partner on hydroelectricity and in just a few weeks, we'll start opening up uh, the bids for deep water wind. Uh, so those are exciting uh, opportunities as well. This, this community is, I think on a per capita basis, one of the largest in the country on solar. I mean, the, 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 the number of, you know, you know, we lead the county in renewable energy production. Nobody comes close to us. Uh, solar, uh, anaerobic, uh, non-anaerobic digester, combined heat and power, uh, yeah, and, and, and anaerobic digester. Yeah. Those are right across the Yeah, we got the yeah. farm and yeah. 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 So you're doing everything you can to be as independent in terms of your energy uh, mm -hmm. supply. We have, lousy, but we have lousy wind, so no. <laughs> no wind. I do <laughs> want to no talk wind. about um, climate change and <coughs> being more um, uh, adaptable to it and being more resilient. Uh, we are working with the legislature on uh, municipal vulnerability assessments. Uh, they, you've been able to mm -hmm. fund uh, this very important program uh, and the uh, secretary, Beaton and I, are spearheading a, an effort uh, to encourage both our coastal communities and inland communities to take part of our grant program to perform a municipal assessment so that you can determine with us where you are vulnerable. And then we'll have an inventory of uh, vulnerability projects that we will then need to uh, determine how to fund to make you more resilient. After to this year, change. it looks like the shore is going to get it all anyway. Well, but it's not just a, a coastline <laughs> issue. We know that there are inland yeah. um, issues yeah. as well. Most changing weather, you know, growing patterns and the like too. Not just to, you know, we all think of the, the rise of seas, but. We can provide yeah, the, the. drought, what was it, two years ago? Right, really yeah. affected all the farms around of here. And, that's um, right. Do irrigation we, and all that kind of stuff. What we can do is provide the uh, information on the MVP program because there is a about $6 million, we can actually announce it tomorrow, mm -hmm. $6 million fund available between now and the end of this fiscal year that you, you could apply to, to do your assessment. And I think that's the first thing that we, we always talk about, right? You need a plan or an assessment, and then you figure out what we do from there. So I, I think you should take advantage of that. So earlier in the conversation, I, I keyed in on your use of the word um, parochial. It's yeah. one of our favorite words around here, too. <laughs> <laughs> in which leads to another question. I think that the state has been wonderful um, about providing resources, either through technical assistance, grant funding, for exploration of regionalization efforts. Yes, right? which you've taken advantage of. Which we have taken advantage of. Um, but what we consistently find, uh, not only in town, but also in talking to um, our colleagues and neighbors across the Commonwealth, is that 
there's an awful lot of exploring and not an awful lot of implementation. And just wondering if, um, and this isn't necessarily um, coming back to further funding, but is there any other support that the can be provided at the state level, whether it's mediation support or, or you know, kind of experiential um, knowledge that would help move some of those efforts to the forward. Okay, so I know the senator was very instrumental in the regionalization and efficiencies program, and uh, the two areas that you took advantage of were the regional approach to wastewater and stormwater management, and the other, and you accomplished this, which is terrific, you formed a regional mosquito control district. We just voted it to just the night. did it. And I, I had the opportunity to, to visit with our friends in Deer, Deerfield. Um, and they talked about how the idea was born and then now you've made it a reality. Mm -hmm. This is so innovative. It's the complete opposite of Pocchio. <laughs> you did something really, really important there. That's a public health issue. And mm -hmm. we thank you for stepping beyond your community and doing that. Uh, what so as examples, how do we take these to another level? I mean, exactly. I think on the stormwater and, and wastewater, we're going to figure out how to, on a regional basis, help you determine that. We do need some federal partners in that area mm -hmm. as well. Uh, there are a lot of mandates that are we all have to work with uh, that are federal mandates that I, I understand are that. difficult to And comply. supposedly Greenfield is going to be looking at a digester, oh. and Springfield, I believe, uh, I don't know where they're at in their process, but the trucking of the sludge is, is really a high figure at the end of the year. Just just for trucking to Lowell is where we're trucking it right now. So if we had a, uh, a more regional, Hampshire, Hamden, Franklin County, maybe even Berkshire County, uh, a more wider array of wastewater treatment plants, and one central location out on this side of the state that we could truck to would save every community thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And uh, as you said, Amherst had an option along with UMass at one time, and now Greenfield's looking at it in Springfield. But I, I think it's, it should be looked at on a state level a little bit further rather than the community level. Because so, it is a big issue. Right. So on that grant, that was it was one hundred and twelve thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, did you create a report? Or did is there an analysis completed that you can share with me? Is this for the NS four? Yeah. So that was run through the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So Correct. Yes. So they have it. Right? They have it. Okay. But we'll provide it later. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the lieutenant governor is short on time. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a little bit, a few more minutes here mm -hmm. to, to go through what we want to uh, on, on your list. I was going to bring up one thing, too, is just our public transportation system. Mm -hmm. The PBTA has mm -hmm. got a lot of funding challenges right now, and that is a service a lot of people coming through the community and around the community use. And I don't know if there's anything that can be done there with Absolutely. UMass funding or other sources and I look forward to uh, working with the legislature on this because the regional transit authorities are critical mm -hmm. uh, for us uh, to help people move around to where they need to go uh, so, so we ha we understand that it's interesting because every re RTA is different mm -hmm. it is a reflection of the demographics of that region uh, what, what we've learned from our work through the say for instance the MBTA uh, the the need uh, to think about the changes in your region, demographics, new employers, the population of young people, older people, and what are their needs. And we found that the MBTA, you just can't keep doing the same things we've been doing for the last 10, 20 years for the next 20, 10 to 20 years because the future of transportation is going to be very different than it was in the past. Technology is changing everything in our lives, including how people um, are moving themselves around. Um, we had a, a report shared with us, an internal report, around 
just that topic. For instance, uh, ride sharing. Uh, ride sharing is, is uh, highly utilized in mm -hmm. this area because of the students, students at Amherst mm -hmm. and moving around this whole region, including in this community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true for uh, the greater Springfield area as well, and then pretty much from the central state, part of the state, through the Cape and the islands, ride sharing uh, is, is a very important asset uh, for people to be mobile. Uh, we need to think about the future of transportation with technology in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's clear. Uh, the RTAs also need to think about how to better serve their customers. Uh, we have fixed routes that have buses that are partially full or in many ways <laughs> very empty because they're heading to places that people don't necessarily go to anymore. So I think we need to be more strategic around using our RTA assets in a way for the future that moves them to the places that can help our economy, help, help them educate themselves, help them get to health care and appointments, and um, be more flexible and innovative about our approaches there. And funding, yes, needs to come in into um, uh, sort of accountability and performance. All of that needs to be factored in to the future way we fund our TAs. So Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for your time. We want to be respectful of it. So it sounds like you have, you have other places to go. Um, but on behalf of the town of Hadley, I think we're very appreciative. Um, we know during campaigns, sometimes people make promises and other people keep them. So we appreciate your continued ongoing outreach to the, all of the municipalities uh, across the state. It's very much appreciated. Thank you yeah, very thank much. You. Congratulations on your yeah. elections. <laughs> your, uh, re-election, not maybe this year, well, next, <laughs> next year. year. Next year actually, yeah. um, I just want you also to, to know, and I don't know if the representative or senator have anything to add, that this is, a, this is a relationship. We very much value our municipal partners. Pat is your Western Mass Director from our office. Mm -hmm. Caitlin uh, travels with me. We are available and accessible to continue to work with you. Uh, you have a great delegation that is very engaged, very available. And it's a pleasure to work with, with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for, the, for the locals who are here, would you mind staying a little bit longer? Is that okay as long as we're here? That's fine. Are you okay? Yeah. So if that's okay with you, that's just, fine with me. I'm sorry I was a few minutes late, that's but okay. uh, I'm sure there are other things that since we're here we can chat about. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. We appreciate the true part Thanks. of your Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Good luck. Thank you. 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 So just want to make sure so that people here know that we're Stan, are you cool with that? We're continuing to stream. Yep. Yeah. Great. Uh, could you talk some more about the digester up in Greenfield? What do you know about what uh, uh, Martin's it's, looking at? It's just in a preliminary plans, I guess, <laughs> because uh, they're also over a million dollars um, in trucking and solid uh, solid waste fees after it's processed and dried out in Lowell. Mm -hmm. Uh, right now, most of Western Massachusetts goes to Lowell because they're, they're one of the biggest plants around. Um, Blackstone, Blackstone's capability is there, but I don't know. Uh, what is Blackstone? Uh, that's uh, in Worcester. It's another oh, facility. Oh, it's an outfit. Okay. It, it's another burn facility, yeah. uh, wastewater treatment facility for Worcester. Um, the way the state had told us they can't make a community put a digester in or put a 24-hour burn plant in or but with with a little bit of funding and a little bit of state help some of these bigger plants uh, may have the incentive to move forward with something like that uh, when Amherst plant was built as a regional plant uh, back in 79 it ran 24 hours at, at its original startup. Northampton ran 24 hours with uh, their 
compressors, which they don't use anymore. Um, but there, there's, there's a ton of options for the bigger plants to expand their services again. And financially, if they had a little help from the state, it, again, it may help you mean all the incentive? Some, some type of incentive, yeah, uh, on the state or on a federal level. I don't know where the di digester money is coming from, just the state, or is there some federal grants out there? We've done some uh, digester grants from food and agriculture <coughs> to farmers, but I'm not yeah. aware. But I'll call uh, Mayor Martin and find out what he's thinking about. So, I mean, you suggest if we could get a regional facility, and if he's interested in it and his community is open to it, yeah, it might work for the region. Yeah. Keeps, keeps, and keeps and like that I money in the region too, as far yeah, as right. sending it out. Exactly. That's right. Trucking it, it out it, the state. And being out on this side of the state, just just the trucking costs, each community would save yeah. a lot geez, of money. thousands of dollars, yeah. thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of dollars. Uh, we're only a very small uh, wastewater treatment plant here right now. We only handle about 400,000 gallons a day, mm -hmm. but you know Springfield's a multi-million gallon yep. uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, Greenfield's a multi-million gallon treatment plant. Mm -hmm. uh, Amherst is kind of seasonal with the college, after talking to them a little bit. Uh, Northampton, they've got Smith College over there, so they've got a seasonal flow also, but you know, they're there are, there are options out there, and amongst the operators, they have been talking. And mm -hmm. this is why I know so much about it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been there for 15 years now, so yeah. we've, we've got a little bit of the inside of, of the, way it, the way it needs to work. So on the PVTA, I just wanted to add <coughs> a few comments because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think John and I were both holding our tongues at that mm -hmm. point. Um, so uh, there are some very valid points about, you know, it's very hard once you establish a root to take a root away. Right. So if, if a root isn't as productive as it should be, you've got to change the equipment. <laughs> and that means we have to have, they have to have a more diverse uh, inventory of, of buses of vehicles. So you're talking about effectively a mini bus as opposed to right. right yeah. And so you've seen and some routes now they've gone to the double length yeah. buses right. Right. and other routes they have the regular buses. Mm -hmm. There's not nearly enough right. of smaller mm -hmm. vehicles that can take care of some of these routes because once right. you establish the route and you know, however many people go to work there or whatever it is, yeah. right. you know, people relocate. They relocate based on where yeah. the transportation is. Yeah. So um, the RTAs have been under a lot of pressure to be more efficient, and they are doing better and better and better. Mm -hmm. That said, we also made a promise four years ago, mm -hmm. and we said no more money for the MBTA unless there's money for RTAs, mm -hmm. and it's in statute. We gave the MBTA a certain amount of money, and then we gave the RTAs a certain amount of money, and we did the first two years. Um, the second, the, the next two years, uh, the governor didn't put that money in either of those budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislature did put the money in, but then you may remember because of the softening revenues, we had to cut six or seven hundred million during conference committee two years in a row. Mm -hmm. So we lost. The PV, uh, the RTA money. So yeah. we should be at eight million more than we are now if the promise is kept, and we are going to do our best mm. to try to get that back in. That will make a huge difference. It still won't solve all the problems. Yeah, they, yeah. they're still going to have to reorganize. They're the still going to have to write, and they're going to have to do more cooperative <laughs> things. You know, we are in Franklin County. We had two RTAs. We spent I spent almost ten years, and we got them to merge. And so now we have one RTA, so we have that savings. Uh, there's overlap between Orange, uh, well, the, the March system and the Franklin mm -hmm. County system. We're trying to deal with that. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of work yet to be done, but that's on the margin. Yeah. It's this is the problem. It's on the margin. It's not the core of the problem. And see, I mean, just help, help me with the logic here because, um, and I think this is a great thing. I mean, uh, the Lieutenant Governor talked about this housing choice bill. And again, I mean, this is, this is becoming a, um, it's a growing topic of conversation in, in town about the, the dearth of housing options. And 
if, if you follow this through to a logical conclusion, wouldn't the increase in the diversity of housing stock also exacerbate the existing mm -hmm. problem of the PV or the RTAs? You would assume so. So, right. so I mean, so it would seem <laughs> that that you would want to hit both of them at the same time because otherwise you're cre you're solving one problem and exacerbating and, and right. expanding, exploding another issue. That's right. And we're trying to do some of that work in, in the legislature at this point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fair share proposal, I don't know where people are on that in this room, but if it is, if the SJC says it can go under the ballot, mm -hmm. it's being challenged at this point, but if they say it can go on the ballot and it passes, that's our biggest hope for communities because all the money is earmarked for education and transportation. Mm -hmm. And when you, if you align those policies with the housing policies and the economic development policies, you then have the complete picture. And we are definitely not well enough aligned. And part of it is we just don't have the resources mm -hmm. at this point. And, um, and part of it is, and, and this is, makes us very unhappy that, um, you know, we, it used to be that we could get nothing. <laughs> for the RTAs, the T get money over and over and over and over again. We finally put our foot down, we finally won it, and and then two years in a row, the governor wouldn't even put it in the budget. Well, so. and I worry because there's also precedent with the- um, But they put every penny for the T. That's what that's the thing. Right. Oh, they didn't cut the T, they cut the- Where are they at with uh, expanding? They didn't cut them, they gave them the full increase. <coughs> oh, oh, okay, yeah. Not the T RTA, yeah. but the T. Mm -hmm. right. And so, at least proportionately. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the Regional oh, Tourism Council suffered the same fate, yes. correct? Yeah. Because that, you know, we fought, we fought, we fought. We were able to get another one created. Created here, yeah. Um, everybody, took a bath on, everybody took a bath on that. So we okay. all got hit equally. So that was equally? But there... But, but the it's RTAs the, it's are the supposed to be effect. funded from the hotel motel tax. Right. There is enough money to fund them. Right. And so that's a different kind of a problem. It's mm -hmm. still a problem. Because mm -hmm. so the money is there, we're just not doing it. What can we do? Um, again, do our homework, make sure we, but what can we do? The administration is not um, tourism friendly on that particular issue. They're they're mm -hmm. uh, they are not focused on that mm -hmm. sector of economic development. I, I'm sorry, actually, wasn't I? I'm was just using that RTC as an example. We we've, we've seen this play out in a negative okay. way before, yeah. but on the regional um, on the RTA transit, yeah. yeah. Well, on the RTAs, I mean, our budget came out yesterday. Sarah Rep, Rep Peak from Provincetown put the amendment in for uh, the additional dollars that were necessary. I, I've already co-sponsored. You, you can tell, mm -hmm. ask me to co-sponsor, but I've already done How much are they trying to get to? I think, I think the 88. 88. Yeah. Um, they come I think committee with uh, level funding or more? Yes. Level funding? Yeah. Um, so that's... And I, obviously, I mean, I had a meeting, I had a meeting with, with, with Senator Chandler. I mean, the good thing, I mean, the, the largest RTA is ours, and then you got Worcester. Uh, uh, and yeah. and so, so, there's a lot of clout where, there. Where are the rails? From Boston to Springfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the East West. Yeah. That um, Senator Les has been that, fighting for the money right to get the study. The recreation yeah. and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Les, uh, Senator Les has been fighting to get the study. Um, it didn't make it through two budgets. Uh, <coughs> it's now been funded. And so the uh, feasibility study. So, is, that study is, is moving forward. Yeah. And John Over, when he was in Congress, got mm -hmm. the first part of the study money and PV, uh, PVPC, Pine Valley Region Planning Commission, yeah. did mm -hmm. that study, um, and it took us only so far. Now we have to go to the next level, and that's what Eric's been fighting for, and, and it's now, the study has now been authorized. Mm -hmm. So that's the next step. So we're at the study there, we're, we're about ready to see dramatic increases in terms of the number of, of, of trips going north-south, yeah. mm -hmm. both from, from yeah. New Haven to Hartford mm -hmm. and, and, and up to Springfield. <coughs> yeah. uh, I mean, that's, that's been extremely successful. Well, that's, uh, that's what I mean. If you had the east-west, along with the busing, because I know the Pioneer Valley planning was involved with all, with, mm -hmm. with the whole scheme, in the whole scheme of things, on a big picture in Massachusetts. So Again, if that fair share passes, there would be money to be able to move dramatically ahead because 
It's going to produce between 1.6 and 2.2 billion in total, both for education and transportation. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you do the math on these projects, so it might be a four billion dollar project, but you pay for it over 40 years, yeah, yeah. and you do the math, it it can be managed. And there's about five of these projects in rail that we need to do around the state. I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. It's four yeah. or five of them. Yeah. So it's it's within it's within the realm of reasonability that mm -hmm. you could do it if you you know, had the will to really change. Because we, c look what's happening now. I mean, you can't get from Amherst to Northampton or Northampton to Amherst in less than 45 minutes in drive time now. Well, we yeah. think that um, perhaps the Lieutenant Governor is about to experience that. Yeah, <laughs> that would be nice for you to see. Yeah. 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 But the point is, you think about that around Boston, but you don't think about that here or right. all over the state. And our yeah, colleagues right. are all having the same stories. Yeah. Roads that 20 and 30 years ago, you could travel very very quickly mm -hmm. now you're you you might as well be in Boston yeah mm -hmm. I, I mean the last uh, count that they had was over 40,000 cars a day through here on Route <coughs> Island, you know and and that was practically doubled since the last time they had done it yeah. you know? populations growing in the state again and in our region because particularly because of the university population continues to grow. There's also a significant number of people retiring here now. Yeah. People are coming here to retire. Yep. And so, you know, when you take, when you do the rule of thumb of how many cars per person or per family or whatever, per hundred, you're going to see it's going to keep rising. And we can't build our way out of that. So we need alternative transportation. That's rail and buses and bus lanes and things like that. I'm making my contribution to make room for those people. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Well, you so just have to keep out. reminding us that you're abandoning us. I know, yeah. That's not Stop right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you better come back and visit. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Any other issues that uh, you didn't get to? Um, uh, before you walked there? in, we were talking about the infrastructure and the Route 9 projects, mm -hmm. and, and we're aware of the District 2 problem. Uh, so hopefully, That'll be straightened out, and the communications will be. So tell me what the District Two problem is. Lack of leadership. Mary Jane knows right. these things inside and out. Lack of leadership. So we're having a problem at the top of. Uh, the he's, not there. he's not there. He's not there. He's not there. He took him out. Yeah. yeah. With the state police. Yeah. Uh, it was a major issue over there. I missed that. <clears throat> okay. When did that happen? Uh, day before yesterday. Oh. Okay. No. Yeah. Oh, no. But it happened. It happened right around. Just a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought you meant like a long-term problem. So, well, no, I'm familiar with that piece of it. Okay. okay. <laughs> it was it was it was a long-term problem for us because David had tried to get in contact with them and to come working. and approach the board for this Route Nine project because they're at 25 percent already, and we we've, we've got major infrastructure issues that that are going to cost the taxpayer you know over two and a half million dollars at some point here between the water, sewer, and drainage. And we, we really need someone, somehow, to see if we can get it added in, or a portion of it added in, or grant money available for uh, the utilities under the state road. Do they put the an acting in? Oh, what? An acting director? Yes. Yes. Is that Rich Massey? Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Richard Massey. Richard Massey, OK. So he's no, very okay. good. No, he's no, very good. No, he was, was, no, was not Richard. The acting was not Richard Massey. Oh, OK. Yeah, right, so that was they, the brought, they brought paper. someone in that starts with a C. OK. Sorry, I was blanking hey, on Mary that. Jane will know, so yeah. I'll check yeah. that out. OK. So I interrupted you. You hadn't finished that, so. Uh, my biggest complaint, and I really didn't address it to her. We, we had many other things on the table, but yeah. You know, uh, the state has came up with some great programs, the Complete Streets Program, yeah. 101, 102, yeah. and... Small uh, Bridge. Yes. And uh, they specifically do the underground work before they put the coat on top, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, a little patch job like that on Route 9 through our community with, with the amount of traffic we've got coming through is not even a temporary fix, in my opinion, you know. If you, you're not going to do the job completely, along with the community, you know, you're, you're not getting anywhere. You're, you're kind of wasting a lot of money and a lot of time, and in the meantime, causing quite a, quite a stir in, in this particular area, you know. Yeah, it's just constant disruption when they're just you know, <coughs> patchworking, paving every couple of years instead of actually fixing the, 
the underlying issue. So, okay. you know, and, and it's really something that that the state's mandating, and uh, along with their their programs for their updates, they they should take into consideration the com complete street program for their own projects. You know, mm -hmm. that's a good that, you, you understand? Yeah, I understand yeah. exactly. That's a great. Yeah, it's totally. Yeah. Totally you sense. know, they yeah. they make the rules, but they're not abiding they by them sometimes. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. and then the other and issue it's a concern that's to me. John brought up to Stan was just a reminder that we we don't, don't seem to be getting any headway with Berkshire Gas. I mean the the cone of silence is down and the DPU is silent. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. So that's that's okay. just a few of the issues we're dealing with, really, yep. on a regular so, basis. Mm -hmm. So any legislative help that uh, on any issue having to do with uh, infrastructure uh, is certainly needed to, we don't need to tell you that you're, you're aware of that, but we would support any kind of effort to upgrade our infrastructure. Yeah. Well, with any luck, eventually Washington will do an infrastructure program and that will match what we're trying to do here. Yeah. It's just so I think um, I think Hadley Media is ready to spend about an hour, so we're going to go ahead and, and um, call it. Meeting. So thank you again, Hank. Thank you to Hadley Media for uh, your coverage today, um, and obviously thank you, Stan and, and John, for uh, for your ongoing support, right. almost ongoing for you. Thank you. Waning <laughs> You're not waning until the very That's last right. day. Come on, it's not too late. We can still write you in, and he fights. I've done that right. Take the.